Life Audio. Hello, and welcome to the Daily Bible Podcast with Trisha and Michelle. We're just two friends reading through the Bible chronologically and encouraging you to do the same. You can follow us on Facebook and or Instagram, Daily Bible Podcast, or go to our website, dailybiblepodcast.net. We are going through the one-year chronological Bible, and we have links for that in our show notes and also at our website. We also have a Facebook group. You could find us in the group section. Just look for Daily Bible Podcast. We would love for you to be part of that community. And also, we would love if you just subscribed. So wherever you're listening, just go in and push subscribe. Even if you're going there all the time and just listening anyway, the subscribe just helps them know that, hey, people like to listen to this. They are subscribing and we should share it with more people. So that would really help us out. And when you subscribe, then also rate us. Give us a star or two or three or four or five. Uh, or whatever the that podcast platform has. So today we are reading Isaiah 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, and 23. All right. So Isaiah, we're back in, you know, we were just up on these very uplifting psalms but now we're back in the prophecy where god is speaking against all these nations and so uh isaiah 18 is a chapter about the prophecy against the land of cush which is also called ethiopia Mm. and they are known for the emissaries traveling via the sea and in vessels of papyrus on the water so you could picture this land with their flowing they travel and they're on their ships in the in the nile river Mm -hmm. and isaiah proclaims that god will take notice and cut down the people, leaving them for birds of prey and the animals. Mm. I mean, that's pretty graphic. Um, Despite this, gifts will be brought. It says they will bring gifts to Jerusalem where the Lord of heaven's armies dwells. And then Isaiah 19, also a prophecy against Egypt. It is predicted that Egypt will be handed over to a harsh master and the Nile River will dry up, causing economic disaster. The chapter describes a lack of wisdom among the Egyptians, leading to infighting and civil war. And the prophecy also foresees the turning of Egyptian against Egyptian. However, towards the end of the chapter, there is hope. It says the Egyptians will turn to the Lord and he will make himself known to them. So Isaiah says, uh, Isaiah 19.20 says, it will be a sign and a witness to the Lord Almighty in the land of Egypt. When they cry out to the Lord because of their oppressors, he will send them a savior and a defender and he will rescue them. So I love that, that the the Lord is even wanting these other nations that are going against Israel to be saved. And the Lord will strike Egypt, but also heal it. In the end, Egypt, Assyria, and Israel will worship together in peace with Egypt becoming God's people. And then in Isaiah 20, in this chapter, Isaiah is called to act as a sign against Egypt and Cush. And he does this by walking barefoot and naked for three years. <laughs> so God's like, hey, hey, Isaiah, let's go walk barefoot and naked. But he okay. asks his people to do some crazy things. Some crazy Hosea had to marry a prostitute. And now mm-hmm. Isaiah has to walk naked. So I looked this up. I'm like, was he really naked? Like I'm Googling, (laughs) was Isaiah really naked? So according to EnduringWord.com, here's a quote that says, we shouldn't think that Isaiah was nude completely without clothing. Instead, he only wore the inner garment customary in that day, sort of like wearing only your underwear or a nightshirt. The message wasn't nudity. It was complete poverty and humiliation. Isaiah dressed as the poorest and most destitute would dress. And that kind of made me feel better (laughs) that he wasn't actually like nude, nude walking around. It's still risque. Um, I mean, if you think about it, it's still there. There's still a a punch that goes with it. When you when you see him, you know that there's something going on. And some people will ask. Some people will just turn their head. Yeah. And I mean. I, w- I was going to say, I mean, can you imagine someone walking around in their pajamas at Walmart? But then I've seen that. So I will I say, say that. Yeah, we, we, <laughs> we are seeing these things these days. Yes. But that, that symbol of him walking around like that 
um, indicates the people of Egypt and Cush will be led away as captives by the Assyrians, stripped down of their belongings and dignity, and it serves as a warning to Judah not to rely on Egypt or Cush for military assistance because they cannot save themselves. And a little spoiler alert, we're going to be seeing some of that. We're going to be seeing some of that in the upcoming chapters where they're like, hmm, Egypt, help us. And it's interesting how what um, our prophets are saying, they do Mm -hmm. come about Mm -hmm. the things that they are saying. So next, next in Isaiah in 21, we see Isaiah has a message concerning Babylon, the desert by the sea. And the coming doom is so bad that the messenger is scared. Isaiah says he grows faint when he hears what God is planning. And he says, I am too afraid to look. Babylonians, well, they are clueless as to the message to and to what will happen, and they are preparing this great feast. And then you will notice that there are three instances that Isaiah talks about watchmen being fully alert Mm -hmm. night after night and remaining at their post declaring Babylon is fallen, fallen. Then, Then there's this conversation between watchmen concerning Edom. One scholar mentioned that What he may be saying is that the long night of Assyrian oppression is almost over and the night of the Babylonian rule will follow a brief morning of respite. And finally, we are given pictures of the refugees from Arabia and the terrors of battle. And Isaiah quotes from the Lord, within a year, counting each day, all the glory of Kedar will come to an end. Only a few of its courageous archers will survive. Mm. I, the Lord God of Israel, have spoken. And we know that when God uses those words, like (laughs) he means business. It's business. It's like, listen to me. I'm your mom. I say that sometimes. Like that just (laughs) takes us to the next level. (laughs) (laughs) So then we go back to Jerusalem and Isaiah is grieved and a little back background here on the Valley of Vision that we read about. Um, Jerusalem, which is a city on a hill, but it's surrounded by still higher hill. And in the midst of this is three valleys. And since Jerusalem was the center uh, for the worship of God, and some of the prophets of God, including Isaiah, it is called the Valley of Vision, Mm. which I thought was fascinating because I've read through the book called the Valley of Vision. I was like, oh, okay. Things just keep Sort of, you know, puzzle pieces just keep sort of popping together. Yeah. So anyway, while so while Isaiah is grieved, he's gone back to Jerusalem. He's talking to the the Israelites now. Um, he's grieved. He's talking to them. The people are running to their rooftops, not because they're escape. They're scared. They want to get a glimpse of the calamity that has mm. come. You know, it's like a bad train wreck. You can't take your eyes off it, and you want to see more and more and more. And and. And, and Isaiah is giving us this picture of what is coming. And and so there is some of the Israelites who are like, <gasps> and there's some who are just like, we just want to see it. You know, we just mm. want to see this, these horrible pictures. So the walls of God's city have been broken. The enemies are on their way and Judah can't fight. In fact, their defenses have been stripped away. So it's not that they're not strong enough. It's that their defenses have been stripped away. But But you would think that in this point, they would ask for God's help. But do they? I wish they did. (laughs) I know. Because then we could end this prophecy right here. You know, even though God gave them a warning, instead, (laughs) they danced and they played. And even more Mm. dire are Isaiah's next word. The Lord of heaven's armies has revealed this to me. Till the day you die, you will never be forgiven for this sin. That, I mean, like never be forgiven. They are told that God is this long suffering God. We've been told throughout scripture so far as we've been reading, God is this long suffering God. Repent and he will forgive. And here's these words. The sin, your sin will never be forgiven. That's some strong words, words. Mm-hmm. and this is this is severe judgment from the Lord of Heaven's armies. And what sin are we talking about? We're talking about the sin of ignoring the Almighty God. Like this is 
This is a bad sin. Mm -hmm. So God Mm -hmm. also has harsh words for the palace administrator because he has failed to do his job. And then Isaiah gave a message to Tyre to the north of, so Tyre is to the north of Israel. It was a leading city of Phoenicia, and it's a great maritime power in the ancient world. And because it is such an important harbor and center for shipping, Tyre was synonymous with commerce and materialism. And Isaiah says they are to mourn and wail, for soon they will be forgotten. But then, as always, God will bring you back to life is what Isaiah says. So we know God's got a plan here. Mm -hmm. And I think it's important to note that God always has a plan. We've seen from the beginning of time in Genesis when he created the earth, there was a plan. When Adam and Eve sinned, there was a plan. When, you know, Abraham, he took Abraham out into the wilderness or and, and showed him all mm-hmm. the stars of the sky, there was a plan. Like in every single turn, every single downturn, there is always a plan God's never at a loss with what to do. And there's always a reason behind what he is doing. He has a plan. And because of that, he can be trusted. And that is such good news when all we see and all we feel right now is this impending doom. Yeah, so good. And, you know, we talk about these places, Tyre and Phoenicia, and like God's like, you're going to be destroyed. You are you are rich now. And we see that like those are like archaeological sites. <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. They aren't there anymore. And they were great, beautiful, prosperous cities. And so it's just amazing how I love when I read archaeological stuff, when I'm writing biblical fiction or whatever, it's like, oh, yeah, this came true. Oh, yeah, that's what the Bible said. It's so like it all came true. What we read, what we're reading here happened. What we mm-hmm. see here happened. So I love that, that. God's word can be trusted and God can be trusted. Yeah, so true. So true. Well, we need to take a break here. We need to hear from our sponsor. And then when we come back, we'll have the word of the day. So stay tuned. Michelle, did you know that ChristianBook.com has been a trusted name in the Christian world of books and curriculum for 45 years? Trish, I hear some exciting news for homeschool parents. If you haven't gotten all your curriculum for the new school year, you need to check out ChristianBook.com. Actually, I buy from them every year, and I just got an order of some new math books. They sell over 45,000 homeschooling products. We're talking curriculum, unit studies, and lots of electives. Their summer sale is happening right now. You'll want to check them out today so that you can enter to win a $500 gift card that you can put towards all your homeschool needs and more. Just register christianbook.com slash daily. So thank you, Christian Book, for your 45 years of service to us. This homeschooling family and so many more really appreciate all you do. That's christianbook.com slash daily to enter and win a $500 gift card. The roof was completely gone. All of our memories being wiped away. The rain is what got 20 us. minutes of sheer terror. And you can feel it in your body. I watched the fire move down the canyon. The rumbling of the house. My son started screaming, we're going to die, we're going to die. In the name of Jesus, we are not going to die. At Samaritan's Purse, we bring spiritual and physical aid to hurting people around the world. We go into dangerous situations because in disaster, in disease, in war, Jesus calls us to love our neighbor, to heal the sick, feed the hungry, restore the broken. All who work and volunteer with Samaritan's Purse follow the example of Jesus. We go to serve, not to be served. And we go in Jesus' name. Join us at SamaritansPurse.org. That's SamaritansPurse.org. Okay, the word of the day is a watchman. And I took it from Michelle's word study on watchman. (laughs) So (laughs) um, it means sentinel or a noun derived from the Hebrew meaning, which means to look about, to spy, or to keep watch, or even to lean forward. So Mm. they're watchful. And watchmen in the Bible were guards responsible for protecting towns and military installations from surprise enemy attacks and other potential dangers. 
ancient Israelite cities often stationed watchmen on high walls or in watchtowers, and their job was to keep watch and warn the town people of impending threats. And how does this apply to today's reading? Well, first of all, in Isaiah 21, there's a dramatic scene of some calling to the night watchmen to determine what will come. Of course, they may not have been happy to hear what was coming, but I think also the watchmen we can apply to us in our lives. So first of all, God is a watchman. And mm-hmm. even beyond the borders of his promised land, God took notice of the kingdoms beyond Israel and Judah. So we live in a world under divine surveillance. Um, God mm-hmm. watched them and he is watching us now. And I love Isaiah nineteen four says, For the Lord has told me this, I will watch quietly from my dwelling place, as quietly as the heat rises on a summer day, or as the morning dew forms during the harvest. So God is always watching. Nothing escapes his gaze. He knows our actions, our words, even our silent thoughts. Even though God is aware of our misdeeds, he also watches with anticipation of drawing us to him and saving him. And I love that so many of these prophecies, it's like, but wait, I'm going to save you. Um, And Isaiah knew that someday God would send a savior even to Egypt. And it made me think of in Acts 8, 26 through 40, we read about Peter sharing the gospel with the Ethiopian eunuch, um, and which is a fulfillment of this, of the Savior being taken to Ethiopia. And so it's so cool that even in the New Testament, we see some of these things coming true. And then the prophet's job was a watchman to urge the people to live faithfully and warn them of the perils of falling away from the Lord and doing evil. So Isaiah stripped down, <laughs> down to his underclothes, mm-hmm. and was that picture walking barefoot and naked to tell them that they are going to be humiliated. And so sometimes we need to strip down from our own pride of self-sufficiency and realize like, okay, we maybe even need to warn others if we see them being prideful. I mean, Michelle, I'm not saying you need to walk around in your underwear, but (laughs) maybe, maybe if there's times we do need to, you know, talk to people like, okay, or even look at ourselves and like, we are letting pride get away with us here. And then as watchmen, we need to warn those who know God and others who do not belong to God. So the city of Tyre faced destruction. And it's a reminder to all of us that pride comes before a fall. And why did God destroy Tyre? In Isaiah 23, 9, it says, The Lord of heaven's armies has done it to destroy your pride and bring low all earthly, all earth's nobility. And so again, it's just a reminder to keep our hearts humble. Um, and then so really... If you're a spiritual leader, if you are a leader of a home, if you're a church study school teacher, any of those things, you are a watchman. Hebrew 13, 7 says, obey your spiritual leaders and do what they say. Their work is to watch over your souls and they are accountable to God. Give them a reason to do this with joy and not with sorrow. That would certainly not be for your benefit. And so if if we take any type of leadership position, I guess, Michelle, I mean, we're leading people and reading through the word of God, we should, mm-hmm. you know, we share things that we see and point them to the savior and point out warnings that we see in the Bible. And it's not our job to make people listen, but it is always our job to speak the truth and do it with love and graciousness and humility, realizing like yeah. we mess up too. But it is amazing that when you look at that word, so many angles of watchmen, God's a watch, watchman and just prophets were watchmen. And then we are like, we need to be telling people what God's word says. And so it's kind of convicting. Well, and I think also individually, we're watchmen in the fact that we're a guard, we're a caretaker of our own hearts and our minds yeah. and what goes in and what comes out. And, you know, our eyes, when you think of a watchman, when you think of the watchman who um, Isaiah was talking to, their eyes were supposed to be peeled they were supposed to be on the lookout, looking for danger, looking for something that would penetrate the walls. They were supposed to be ready to handle that danger. They were prepared. Mm-hmm. They were trained. And so we are too. We we are supposed to, I mean, if we are in um, spiritual leadership, yes, you need to be trained. But even individually, as we are reading our Bibles, we are being trained daily if we just keep on the lookout and look mm. for what God is teaching us because we we are watching too and we are in charge. I mean, God is ultimately in charge of our hearts, but um, we're in charge of softening and, um, and, and looking to Him, looking to Him as our ultimate watchman. 
Yeah. So Trisha, can you can you pray for us today as we go about our day and as we guard guard our lives and guard those around us? Mm-hmm. Dear Heavenly Father, first of all, I thank you that you are our watch watchman and you are always have your eyes on us. You're always alert and you always care for us. Um, that should bring us peace. <laughs> and for those that it doesn't bring peace, I pray that you will show us where we need to just confess our sins to you, Lord. And I pray that we will be diligent watchmen ourselves, watchmen over our own hearts, that we may not let entrance to anything that does not belong and that does not give you glory, but also help us to speak the truth in loving caring ways for those around us, Lord, to let them know about your goodness and let them know about the dangers of not falling in your ways. Lord, help me to do this better with my children. Help us all to do it better, um, just even in our communities and in our families. And we just thank you and praise you. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, we are sending you off with some daily encouragement to get into the Word and be the hands and feet of Jesus. Again, if you don't have the one-year chronological Bible that we are using, we have links to that Bible in our show notes. You can even find it in the Kindle format. Also in the show notes is a monthly and yearly schedule of the Bible reading plan that we are following. So tomorrow, we continue on in Isaiah, Isaiah 24, 25, 26, 27, 29. So we are skipping Isaiah 28. And you might be saying, hasn't we heard enough? Mm, no, <laughs> we, we haven't There's because more. the people are not waking up. So we'll continue in Isaiah tomorrow. I want to take a second here to thank the team at Life Audio. You would not be listening to Trisha and myself without their partnership. Go to lifeaudio.com and there you will find a lot of other great podcasts, Christian podcasts that are going to encourage you in your walk with God. They've got podcasts um, for men, for women, for kids. It's just a great area to go and get encouraged. That's lifeaudio.com. And we will see you here tomorrow. Bye-bye. Hey, friend, do you ever feel like the busyness of life makes it hard to slow down and truly connect with Jesus? Do your priorities and passions feel jumbled and out of whack? Then join me this summer on my podcast, How to Study the Bible, as we dive into Spiritual Rhythms, a six-week series that will lead us through six spiritual rhythms to help us slow down and make space for Jesus in the busyness of everyday life. To guide us, I've put together a free downloadable six-week study available at nicoleunis.com slash spiritual practices. The study will walk us through God's word as we learn to embrace daily practices that draw us closer to Jesus. Each week on the podcast, we'll walk through one spiritual rhythm that helps us discover how to spend intentional time with God, align our passions and balance our priorities, and make time and space for restfulness and celebration. Download spiritual rhythms for free today at nicoleunis.com slash spiritual practices, and I'll see you on how to say the Bible.